Hey, greetings, friends. Uh, Jacques Howard here. Thank you so much for tuning in and make sure that you show some support to whatever outlet it is that you're hearing one of my programs. In addition to that, make sure that you reach out to the guests that I'm bringing to you. Um, these are human beings, again, that I have I admire for whatever they're, they're doing, their profession, their skill set. Generally, it's something that I don't have. So with that being said, I'd like for you to make sure that you follow up with my guests and um, reach out to me on any social media platforms. You can find Jacques Reach. You can also through Trenton 365, Library Boxes of Trenton, and Bridge to Vote. Reach out to me on any of those platforms. We can have a conversation. You can make some suggestions about some people I should be sitting down having a conversation with. Stay tuned for a lot of things that are going to be coming down the pike regarding health and nutrition. That includes mental health. Conversations on cannabis. It's also going to include uh, more ADA compliancy happening in the city of Trenton and more. Remember, just follow the hashtag Jacques Reach or on the website Trenton365.com. It is now time for me to bring to you my new friend, Kiki Wooten. And Kiki's got a very interesting story, and uh, we're going to give her an opportunity to share as much of it as possible. Um, but before we do that, I want to, first of all, tell whoever is going to be listening, this is going to be a little bit different than what you've heard before in my program. Kiki is uh, not only an advocate, um, she is a survivor, and she's doing some amazing things. And uh, so I am going to challenge you to follow up with her uh, and to hear more about what she's doing, um, how she's advocating, how she's educating, and how you can hire her to come to speak to your small group, to partner with you in some capacity, et cetera. Until then, Kiki Wooten, thank you so much again for your time. And uh, let's chat a little bit about who you are and, and pretend as though we did not have some amazing communications via phone calls and um, uh, emails, et cetera. Hi, Jacques. Um, well, my name is Kiki, and uh, I work as a chef, 38 years old. I have daughter, husband, you know, a, a simple family life. However, a few years ago, things were not quite as simple as, you know, what I just said. Um, I was experiencing some not unusual symptoms. Um, there are women in this world that um, during their menstrual cycle, they kind of get little cysty, lumpy in their breast. And I had always been that way since I was a young teenager. So I didn't really think anything about it when I felt what I thought was a cyst. However, the thing that was different is that I noticed that the cyst just didn't go away and it kept growing. And as time went on, um, I wasn't able to perform my job as well as I was used to doing. I couldn't even put my shirt on by myself. I had to have my husband help me. So, you know, there came a point in time where my husband kind of just sat me down. He's like, listen, I don't know what's going on, but you really need to go to the doctor and get this checked out. So I'm like, all right, whatever. It's, it's nothing. So I go to the doctor and, you know, the first thing they say is your age. Age is always like a, a factor when it comes to certain health issues that, you know, we may go through. And they're like, you know, it's probably just a cyst. So it's probably nothing to really worry about. But something deep inside my spirit told me I need to really just get this checked because it, it, it was different. Something and it was different than what I had experienced, you know, previously. And they were like, you know, all right, we'll send you for the mammogram. But, you know, if that makes you feel better. I went for the mammogram about two weeks later. And because I had such dense breasts, they wound up having to do a 3D mammogram, which is totally different from a regular mammogram. So people with dense breast tissue, um, sometimes it's hard to actually uh, see different tumors or you, know, you have a lot of fatty tissue, so it can actually look like something, but it, it really may not be anything. It might just be the fatty tissue. And um, after that was done, you know, I was okay. I got dressed and they were like, well, you know, we want you to come in the back room and the radiologist um, is going to talk to you, which I found very alarming. I have had multiple CAT scans and things like that. And I had never went in the back before for anything else. So I'm like, okay, maybe this is standard procedure. Because again, I had never had a mammogram before. So, you know, I, I didn't know what the outcome was supposed to be or, you know, what they should be telling. 
and uh, the radiologist came in. I was calm. I really didn't feel, you know, scared or nervous. You know, I'm just, are you just going to tell me that it's a cyst? And uh, that's not what he said. After looking at the images, he said to me right then and there, he's, I'm about 99% sure that this is some form of cancer. He could have said a million other things. And that's all that I heard. I, I felt very just numb for the rest of the time that I was there. And I'm just like, cancer, like what, what are they talking about? And then it dawned on me, I was by myself. Now I had to drive home thinking about this. How am I gonna tell my husband? Then I'm like, oh my gosh, I have a young daughter who was five years old at the time. What's gonna happen to her? I'm like, am I gonna die? You know, all these different things kind of went through my head. And it was just kind of like, okay, we have to do a biopsy to determine, you know, the, the type and, you know, we'll contact you. And that's just kind of like how things were left. And I was just, I was like in limbo. Like, what, what, what do I do? Do I tell my family members now? Do I wait until I get the biopsy diagnosis? Like so many things ran through my head. Um, you know, and when I got home, my husband was home and he's like, oh, how did everything go? And I just kind of blurted it out. I was like, well, they are 99% sure that I have some form of cancer. And he's like, wait, what? And I felt so terrible because he just dropped down to his knees and he just started crying. And I'm like, listen, in a minute, I'm going to need you to get it together because I'm going to need some comfort in myself. <laughs> um, but hey was uh, really one of the worst moments of my life. And um, we just kind of sat in silence for about five minutes. It felt like an eternity, but in reality, it was really just a few minutes. And I called my mom, who was at work at the time. And, um, you know, I was like, well, I have something to tell you. And I told her and, you know, she's crying on the phone because I'm like, I, I don't know what to do. and that kind of like waiting process, waiting to uh, even get in the, for the appointment for the, the uh, biopsy was like another three weeks. So here I am, three weeks, I have to wait and be anxious. And I felt all the, these different emotions that I didn't know how to handle. <sighs> so got the biopsy. Um, then I had to wait an additional two weeks to get the results back. So all in all was like literally like two months of, of anticipation and waiting to hear what type of cancer I had. And I will never forget this. It was October 1st, 2019, which is ironic because October is breast cancer awareness month. Um, I got the call from the radiologist and they said, um, we are sorry to inform you. You do have uh, a type of cancer called invasive ductal carcinoma stage 2a and um it's very aggressive so we really have to like jump on this um and from there they gave me um my first appointment with uh, the cancer institute saw the surgeon and you know before we could decide on what type of um treatment I needed to get, we thought it was a good idea for us to do genetic testing. At the time that I found out, my older sister, who was actually my half-sister, was dealing with breast cancer as well. So we were trying to figure out, is it a family dynamic? Was this just like a weird coincidence? So that was our, our first um, stage was to get the genetic testing done. And I'm so happy that I did. I mean, it was a very, very simple test. All they needed was saliva. Um, I had my mom come with me. She did the test as well. So we can kind of pinpoint, you know, where, if, you know, the, the cancer, if I had a cancer gene, where it was coming from. And unfortunately, I do have um, a cancer gene. It is not BRCA1. It is not BRCA2, which are the two most that we 
we hear about, we don't hear about any other uh, cancer genes. So we found out um, that my cancer gene is actually in my ATM RNA, which is different from your DNA. So it was a, a two-part series test. So I'm, I'm happy that they did the two parts. I would not know this information. And um, it was very important for me to know that because I do have a child. Knowing that um, there is a 50% chance that I did pass this gene on to her. Um, so that was... I was relieved to know that I had the gene, but also it devastated me more because now I can't just worry about myself. I have my daughter that I now have to worry about. Um, so after finding out that I had the, the gene, um, I decided to do what is called a bilateral mastectomy, which is basically getting both breasts removed. Um, that was always my first decision. Uh, you know, they try to convince me, like, you know, maybe we'll just take the bad one. I'm like, no, 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 just take them both because I don't want to have to go through this again if it comes back, especially because I do have the gene where, you know, cancer can come back. So we did that. Um, that was a 14-hour surgery uh, with them removing the tumor. The tumor was actually, like, as big as my fist. Um, they actually didn't see that some of the tumor was actually behind the muscle. So they had to tear the muscle and then repair it back together. Um, so it took them longer than what they anticipated. Um, and we also had the plastic surgeons there, you know, because I was 34. I still wanted to look like you know, a young woman. So I, I wanted breast implants. So after they took the tumor out, the um, plastic surgeons put in what it's called tissue expanders. So basically it's, uh, they get your chest cavity ready for the implants and week by week, they inject saline, saline solution into you to kind of like expand the skin until you get the desired look that you want. You know, if you want to go big, go big. you want to be small, go small. Um, so after a few weeks of healing, um, I noticed that I just wasn't feeling right. Something just was off with my body. And I didn't know if it was because of, you know, just the surgery, if it was the cancer, I had no idea. But um, I went to the hospital because I'm like, I developed like just a, a low grade fever. And uh, it turns out that the tissue expanders um, made me develop sepsis. So they had to do an emergency surgery to take the tissue expanders out. So now that's already two surgeries in the course of a few months. Within that time, and they put in the, the breast implants just to see if, you know, that would be okay. I was hospitalized eight times because I developed what they call seroma. So seroma is um, pockets of fluid within the, the breast tissue. So every time I would develop them, they'd have to stick a drain in my side drain all the fluid and be careful that they didn't puncture um, the, the breast implants because that could lead to something um, called BLL, which is um, like, uh, it's, it's a breast illness. I mean, BIL, I'm sorry. Uh, and we didn't want to do that because I was already going through so much. And each time that happened, I had to be on antibiotics. So imagine being on antibiotics for the sepsis the first time and eight other times having to be on antibiotics. Then we throw in the chemo factor. Now, when I started the chemo, it was right at the beginning of, um, of COVID. So I had one session where I, I had my mom with me. Then after that, I'd have to be at the hospital for eight hours by myself, getting my chemo injections. You know, it's about a seven, eight hour process. And I was devastated um, that I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't have my support team that I needed there. The second time I developed sepsis, also right in the beginning of COVID, um, I was hospitalized for about two weeks. I didn't see my daughter because I couldn't have anyone come visit me. Um, and that was really, really hard because that day that I, I said, you know, 
I'm going to call the doctor. I'm not feeling well. And, you know, my, I told my daughter, you know, I'll be right back. You know, the doctors are just going to check me and make sure that, you know, mommy's okay. And I didn't see her for about two weeks. And when I saw her, she was very withdrawn from me. And I was like, aren't you happy to see me? And she says to me, and I'll never forget this, mommy, you lied to me. You said that you were coming right back and you didn't do that. You said it's not a good thing to lie to people, but you lied to me. So how can I trust you? And now at this time, I, my, my daughter had just turned six. So I'm just like, oh my gosh, you know, innocently, that's what I said. But in her eyes, she didn't understand that I was sick and I needed to stay at the hospital to get the proper care and treatment. She just knows that her mommy told her that she'll be right back. And that didn't happen. Um, and, you know, having the conversation with her, if I was going to go to heaven, I didn't know my daughter even thought about that. And uh, we had never talked about cancer before any of this happened. However, when we did, she knew it was something bad. She knew it was something she didn't want her mommy to have. And, you know, she's like, are you going to go to heaven? It's not a conversation you really want to have with a five, six-year-old. But we had to have it. And it was very uncomfortable. Um, I was very really uncomfortable having that conversation with her, but I tried to be as honest as possible and said, you know what? The doctors are gonna do all that they can and mommy's gonna do all that she can. And hopefully, you know, I will be here for you. And that was the best answer that I can come up with because I didn't, I didn't have a definitive answer. You never know. Things go sideways all the time. You could be making progress and then boom, you know, like, like my case, you know, I was doing good for a couple of weeks and all of a sudden, boom, here comes sepsis. So um, it was really hard. It was really hard. And, um, you know, Kiana, um, Kiki. Yes. Um, I'm sure everyone who sees this is going to, um, you know, think similarly and, and say, wow. And um, kudos to you, you know, for and your family and all the support that you've had to go through this, um, that you have and that you are in the space that you are now. I mean, you're in a good place now, correct? Correct. Yes. So um, from a, a media perspective, I, I appreciate you and the willingness that you have to tell your story, but to tell your story um, as an advocate. And when I say advocate, I know we don't have time, definitely don't have time to go through all the notes and things that we've been communicating. Right. But um, as you come back and we talk more and we try to try to figure out how this looks for like some events, some in-person opportunities for people to meet you and talk to you. Um, in, the, in, the, in the near future, we'll be talking about the importance of family history. Yes. And family history, especially as people of color and also from blended families, it's important because you could be carrying something, passing something on that maybe that person, the mother, the father, whatever, the parent isn't in, in your life, so to speak, anymore. But it's still important to be connected because that family history and you nailed it, you know, talking about yours. And and I, it's going to be interesting to hear how people respond to um, the family history portion, especially when you go into detail about yours. Um, um, the support system portion, I'm looking forward to chatting about that. And also, um, you know, if your husband is available to come on as well, because, you know, in our lead up conversations, you had mentioned how important it is to have a support system and uh, the communication and so forth that goes on there, which is also another subject. And then also, um, being prepared. Um, you're probably going to lose some friends and associates because of this. And, and that's just the, the nature of things. And, and you should be prepared for that, along right. with a, a bunch of other things. Um, you know, when 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 people look for you online, they're going to see all this, all these interviews, all these different things that you've done, music, et cetera, <laughs> all these things. And I can't wait to talk to you more and more about that. But for you, um, where is the best location where people should go to stay completely connected with you? Because they could go through social media or they could go just do an internet search and see all the 
interviews and podcasts and things that you've been on, but what is the main site that you'd like to have people go to? So if you go to Instagram, my name is hashtag the breast decision. Um, you can also catch me on Facebook, same name, the breast decision. And uh, I'm, I'm on there all the time. Uh, if you DM me, I'll definitely get back to you, you know, so. All right. So um, before we finish up, uh, Kiki, I want I want to just touch on a few other, other things. Um, when you've got when you got your bilateral mastectomy done, um, you made a choice to celebrate it, meaning you are kind of out front letting it known, like even some of the artwork um, and imagery and fashion fashion <laughs> shoots that you've done, you've, you've kind of um, embraced it. Um, can you just talk about that advocacy portion and, and what led you to make you and your family, of course, to make the decision to uh, embrace it as opposed to covering it or hiding away from it? Well, it was, it was actually uh, my husband and my mom that kind of like pushed me towards, you know, embracing everything. Um, after the the second sepsis and I had to have another surgery and now take the implants out and I decided to go flat, you know, I, I was depressed and I'm like, you know, this makes me feel like less of a woman because I didn't have breast. And my husband thought the total opposite. He was like, you know what, you need to take these scars and if you're going to advocate, you have to be as transparent as possible. You have to be real with people. Um, you know, you, you have to go out there and show them that you are still vibrant and beautiful and your breasts don't make you who you are you know it's a part of who I am now having these scars but you have to embrace them it's like and you know he was like I think you're more beautiful now because you're you opened up you finally got out of your shell and I I guess that's what was meant to happen (laughs) I would have never done a photo shoot if I had been you know just normal Kiki (laughs) So it's definitely put me on a, a journey that I never thought I would be on. And I'm so grateful for the journey, honestly. Oh, man. All right. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to meet him. I can't, can't wait, wait to great. meet him. Um, <laughs> yeah, he sounds like, like an awesome, awesome man. And, uh, and I would assume an awesome father as well. Um, you know, in some of the later conversations, too, uh, I want to make sure that, that we, we talk about the conversations and the relationship that you have with, with your daughter. And as you said, like you touched on some different things and some hard questions. And and I'm sure it's like PTSD for her to an extent, like at six years old and to where, you know, she is now. Um, if it's OK, I'd, I'd like for you um, and whomever else to talk about, you know, having that communication as a parent to a child during a, a very difficult time. Um, mm-hmm. And then I, I also want you to to, you know, share about like some of your ideas, like the grandiose ideas, like the idea of, hey, how do we encourage and celebrate more stories of successes and bringing, you know, more experiences of people together and like having a gala or something like that, that will, you know, help support your ideas and your causes. Um, Are you in a space where you want people to reach out to you and, and say, hey, look, I'm here to volunteer, Kiki. I'm here to do whatever I can to support your efforts and your cause? Uh, not yet, but I will be, <laughs> you know, I, I, I never say never, you know, cause there's so much that I want to do, you know, cause when I dream, I dream big. And this was a dream I, I, I never thought would be possible. I never thought that I'd write a book and publish it, but that's what I've done. So absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. So, uh, Kiki Wood, um, before we finish up, um, I can't wait to have you back on to talk about um, not only your story, um, but the people who are in your life. Um, but also, I'm a music dude. <laughs> I, I think, um, you know, I think music is one of those international languages that can do so much for so many people. Um, before we finish up, I just want you to tease and touch us a little bit or tell us a little bit about music and um, what it has meant to you during this most recent journey. So music has always been an outlet for me. I never considered myself a, a singer, quote unquote. Um, but when I heard um, Rise Up by Andre Day, it touched me in a way that no other song has ever touched me. And, you know, my husband was just like, why don't you remake this song and 
you know, make it support the cause that's important to you. He's like, because, you know, the message is there. And I was just like, you are absolutely right. And that's what I did. And um, we did it in about four takes. And, you know, I had, you know, my coworkers in the video, my husband, my daughter, family members, friends, um, people from my daughter's school, you know, they were all in the video because they were there through everything, you know, supporting my daughter, supporting me, supporting my family. And um, I really wanted to include them in something that was is bigger than me. It's bigger than all of us. Um, and it was a great experience. So um, I look forward to doing some more music in the near future. Fantastic. Oh, man. Kiki Wu, thank you so much for spending some of your time with me and my audience. Uh, I can't wait to sit down and chat with you more and to come alongside, stand in front of you or in, behind you um, in this effort. OK. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And there you have it, folks. Um, Kiki Wooten, um, just opening up, being candid, just sharing information, um, experiences with a clear intent for you so you can be uplifted and encouraged and that you can rise up as her music says. During this breast cancer month, folks, please let's not think about this as only a one time a year kind of thing. Just because it's been marketed and celebrated that way, this is every day for many people. And it behooves all of us as human beings to consider all of human beings and what we're going through. Jacques Howard here. Remember, folks, it's always about justice, peace, and humility.